My name is Michael Bonn, and I am the author of City, Book One, Singular Assumptions. Well, the Olson poem is a, well, it's a beautiful poem, and it's very mysterious in a lot of ways. It comes out of a conversation that he has with a, a, vet, a myth from the Vedas. Uh, I think he picked it up in a book by Zimmer. Um, but his uh, relationship to the myth changes, during the, I think, during his thinking about the writing of the poem, because the myth, as I have come to read it, is different than the way Olson uses it in his poem. Like, so his conversation leads to the flowering of another way of thinking of these same elements. And my reading of Olson then initiates a conversation where I do pretty much the same thing with his poem. Um, my interest in it being the idea of the three towns, which it turns out, well, as I told it last night in the reading, the, it's, the story is about these demons who take over the three towns and compress them into one and cause all kinds of mischief, uh, bad stuff happening everywhere. And then uh, Brahma gets Shiva to shoot an arrow through them. He's the only one who can do it, and it frees the three towns to open up again. So that's the basic story in, in Olson's poem. And that's what I'm working with, except as I'm working with it, I wanted to explore the three towns and see what they were, really. What are these three towns? As the poem has unfolded for me, uh, it's involved a kind of engagement with the thinking of visionary levels of experience of the city. That would be my summary of it. In the, in the Vedic myth, the three towns are the earth, the sky, and the firmament. Those are the names for it. And they're a, like a demonic fortress. And when they are co coagulated or brought together into one massive, undifferentiated thing, they really become uh, a problem for the whole universe. It's threatened by this. So I was thinking about what does that mean in terms of, well, first of all, what does it mean in terms of writing? <laughs> you know, like if you're going to take this on, if, you're, if I'm proposing to move from, with each book to a different town, which is to say a different visionary state, well then what is that, how does the writing work in that context? It's not, it, the city is enters into it all the time because it's the city, right? I mean, here we are. It is the city. In the first book, especially this one, um, I have uh, I was affected by the current politics of Toronto, and there's some stuff in there about the war on the car and various pot shots at the uh, former mayor. <laughs> Hopefully, the former mayor. But that's because that whole narrative struck me as being a part of the first town in a sense. It's a, it's a constricted understanding of what the life of the city could actually be. It's all about taxes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's it? That's all we care about? I was thinking about Olson's proposal that, we, that we've that we never learned how to live in the ordinary. So that we're constantly anticipating the end. Like there must be, what, 12 post-apocalyptic TV shows on right now, you know, from The Walking Dead to Falling Skies to you name it. The list goes on and on. Because everybody kind of secretly wants the world to end so they don't have to go back to work tomorrow, you know? Like <laughs> there's a there's a... There's definitely that happening. And so these, the poems were all about that 
idea of the apocalypse coming and then okay now we're at now after the apocalypse <laughs> and then another one and then after that and then later and then so they end up evoking a, a very particular sense of time as being between the time of the poems as being between the end of time and whatever's next. <laughs> I have no idea where I'm going before I start. You know, famously, I'm going to bring in my quote from Deleuze. You know, famously, Deleuze said, the map is not the territory. And it's the territory that I'm interested in. Um, but since we have mapping here with as an activity that comes out of entering into the territory and discovering there what there is to be discovered. Yeah, it's mapping in that sense, absolutely. Um, this poem, I think more than any poem I've ever written, is a little uh, terrifying to me on that level because <laughs> I'm dealing with these th three supposed different visionary levels and the, the, the mapping... I have no idea how it's going to end up playing out at the end. The first book was pretty easy because there's lots of low humor in the first book and lots of satire of the ridiculous antics of polit certain politicians um, that we've had to put up with here. The kind of really stupid behavior that's singular <laughs> and full of assumptions, right? Um, book two, I think it's really interesting what's happened in book two, which I recently finished. Uh, and I had no idea how it was going to play out, but I think it played out okay. And now I'm sitting on the verge of book three and shaking in my boots trying to figure out how I'm actually going to, what's going to happen and how the mapping is going to proceed. The war on the car. War and car don't rhyme, though you'd never know it by looking. Having formed every square and passage to its wheels, asphalt and cement sock sewn tight, imposed angular bound vision into knotted contortions, leave limbs wrenched, dislocated, cramped, shadows of known reach each inch twisted out of vehicular contractions of morphogenetic plenitude into rigor of its intersections, each one timed out of squared seconds stacked laterally across expanses of imagination's former self, dark formulations of encounter rising from ashes of place, Declarations of war ring with sardonic amplifications of victorious erasures contempt for the loser who looks first right, then left, except in England's green pastures, then steps into it. Sometimes it's a river of asphalt. When the shape of water is lost, the war enters a new phase, waxing gibbous in pedestrians' minds and the dreams of commuters waiting for the light to change. Ghosts of entire forests wail, but war is already beside the point since world that ended remains without adequate ventilation, leaving this one with its lavender and lilac floating on what can only be considered a very subtle inflection with little credibility beyond fading claims of necessity and undulations of blue to fend for itself with no chance of sure footing. Hephaestus may step out of the truck, squat and blunt, dip the key in oil and fire the ignition, but who sees him? And where can you go when the nets drop in badly rhymed imitations of real streets? Impassable idea of rush, a declension of freeway as it plays out in sluggish rivers of red in the night, stalled light. Meanwhile, 
the war returns when hordes of cycles descend on the city out of the north, an important sign of further origins than the regular ones. The cars taken by surprise roll back before two-wheeled bell-ringing berserker onslaught. Regrouping at halts, they emit an impassable wall of carbon monoxide lays waste to every living thing around, leaving marauding cycles down and scattered across endless asphalt sweep. The cars win the war, driving back and forth over mangled frames, twisted tires, honking and squealing, they're all weather Michelins. A National Automobile Appreciation Day is declared, and everyone has an extra fill-up on the mayor before resuming their place in line.